Okay, all right, so uh, welcome back from the break. Okay, so um, we're done with the, with the NMR part. Okay, um, like I said, you've got the tools to, um, to continue with NMR. And basically what we did till now, after the quantum information part, is that you know, we looked at the classical spin. Then we moved on to a quantum spin. And that basically gave us the tools to talk about the NMR system. Um, and now what we're going to do is we're going to take a path that will lead us eventually to a photonic quantum computer. They're not really a photonic quantum computer, but a model for, for a quantum computer that uses uh, photons as the qubits. Okay. Um, now, to get to to a photonic quantum computer, we really need to understand photons. Okay, and photons is quantized light. Um, so the first thing we're going to have to do is we're going to understand quantized light. And, and we're not going to do this, you know, rigorously, because that, that takes time. Um, rigorously, this is done in the light matter interaction course, uh, where we do uh, full quantization and everything and go into the details. But what I do want to get to in this course is the main point. Okay? And I want you to understand that light or electromagnetic modes, okay. um, electromagnetic field modes, yeah, are simply quantum harmonic oscillators. This is, this is going to be the main point that I will want to drive home. Okay? I will try to qualitatively explain how from Maxwell's equations we get the fact that Electromagnetic uh, fields are just quantized harmonic oscillators. Okay? It will be pretty high level. I will explain the ideas. I will reference you to where you can find the details, but we will not do the full derivation. And after we understand this, then we will be able to understand, again, not fully, but we will have somewhat of a concept of what is a photon state, what is a single photon, uh, and what is a coherent state. Now, a coherent state is just a classical state, but we will see it's a classical state. It's basically what is described by a sine wave. So if you just take an electromagnetic field and classically drive it, okay, take a voltage and output it in a sine wave, you will get the coherent state. So we will see the, the quantum description or what, how a coherent state is described as a quantum harmonic oscillator, and we will understand the importance of, the, of this thing in the context of quantum computation. Okay? And all this together will bring us to, to this thing. So this is our next chapter. This is what we're going to do. Uh, th this is the next thing that we're going to do. Okay? All right. Now, um, a very good reference to, to quantum optics and quantizing light and everything is the book. So please open and read the book by Walls and Milburn. Um, maybe it's a double L, Milburn. Okay. Uh, and it's called Intro... I wrote here quantum optics, but it might be called intro to quantum optics. I don't remember. 
So it might be intro to quantum optics or just quantum optics. Okay? And the chapter that you want to read is chapter 2. Okay, it has most of the relevant things to what we're going to do. <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to try to understand how do we get a quantum harmonic oscillator from the electric field, electromagnetic field. And I'm going to start with a reminder, and I'm just going to write here Maxwell's equations for you, just so you have it in front of your eyes. So these should be familiar to you, uh, Maxwell's equations. Uh, and you also know that we can parameterize Maxwell's equations using uh, the vector potential and the scalar potential, right? So you remember that we can define B as the curl of A and E. minus grade, gradient of phi minus dA dt. Okay? So all this should be familiar to you. Okay? Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to work in the Coulomb gauge. So you know that we have a, a gauge degree of freedom in the Maxwell's equations. You've seen this, and we're going to work in the Coulomb gauge, okay? And we're going to work in the Coulomb gauge because there um, it is very convenient to deconstruct the independent field variables and the dependent field variables. What do I mean? I mean that the electric field, we can divide it into the field, the parallel components of the electric field and the perpendicular components of the electric field. And in the Coulomb gauge, this is where we'll be working, okay? So this is where the divergence of A equals zero. And because the divergence of A equals zero, it means that the parallel component of A is zero. And what this means for the electric field and the magnetic field is that the parallel part of the electric field is just going to be some function of the charge distribution, rho. Okay, maybe do a rho of r and t here. Now everything really should have r and t, r, t, and so on and so forth, but we, we can omit that for now. Um, and then the independent variables of the field become now the, per, um, the perpendicular part of E and B. Well, B parallel is zero anyway, so you can mark it like this or not mark it like this. These are left as the independent variables.
and they strictly depend now in this gauge on A perpendicular and A perpendicular dot. It means that we can parameterize our fields in terms of the vector potential. And this is the important part. Okay. And what we're going to do, or what is done in the derivation, we're not going to do this explicitly, is basically break up this A into normal modes. Okay, normal modes of motion. And those normal modes are the harmonic oscillators. Okay? So let me write this down. So now A, is, we're going to break it up into <coughs> normal modes. And these normal modes, they're the basically, they're frequencies, they're modes of motion You've done this many times with harmonic oscillators. You take something and, and you have your normal modes. And you can think of them as springs in a problem with the spring on mass. Okay. Um, <coughs> but, but the formalism and everything is the same. Now, if you want the rigorous derivation, then you can go to the book called uh, Atom Photon Interaction. Interaction by uh, Cohen Tanuji. Um, sorry, it's Claude Cohen Tanuji, right? Claude Cohen Tanuji and two other authors, which I wrote somewhere. Uh, the other authors, I'm sorry. Um, let me find, I wrote the other authors just so you have it. Um, DuPont and Grimberg. DuPont and Grimberg. And in the appendix, there is a very thorough derivation. Uh, it is actually the derivation that uh, you do in the atom photon interaction course, or uh, uh, that's given the next semester. <coughs> So this is for the thorough derivation. A more qualitative, yet very instructive discussion you can find in the Serge Hiroche book uh, that I already uh, gave you. Um, um, what was it? Um, um, what was the name of his book again? Um, Exploring the quantum. Uh, and there you have chapter three. It's a great chapter that discusses uh, light, quantized light, spins, and the interaction between spins. Okay. We're going to go into the physics of that chapter after we finish with our photons, but you can still look uh, in the beginning of this chapter, uh, and it has some further details about this. Okay. Um, so, but the main point when we break this into normal modes is that each mode now we'll have a certain frequency. So we have the transverse components of our fields, the electric field and the magnetic field. And those 
are described by distinct frequencies, a spectrum of frequencies. If we were in the vacuum, well, then we have a whole continuum of frequencies. And these frequencies are connected to the k vector through the speed of light. And also, they have two polarizations such that E dot K equals zero. Okay, so now we're going to write We're going to write the Hamiltonian for a single mode. Okay. So now I'm going to take a single mode, a single K, and what we're going to see that the single K, the single mode that's characterized by a specific K, again, I'm not deriving, I'm giving you the result. This is described by a quanti quantum harmonic oscillator, the h bar omega a dagger a that you're familiar with. Okay? So if you write the Hamiltonian for the field, which you've seen before, so half integral dv epsilon naught e squared plus 1 over mu naught b squared, If you do your quantization properly and everything, um, you will get the known result of h bar omega a dagger a plus half, or in terms of momentum and position variables, right, harmonic oscillator, you can describe it in phase space with momentum and position, so it will be half p squared plus omega squared q squared, where p and q are the position and momentum. Sorry, th this is the position. This is the momentum operator, and they're going to be related to a and a dagger, which are the lowering and raising operators for a harmonic oscillator in the following way. Um, so I h bar omega over 2, a dagger minus a. This is our momentum. And q oh wait This is our position. Okay, so we have units of, well, kind of units of position and momentum. It's an electric field, but yeah. Now, to be more explicit, we can write down the electric field operator and the magnetic field operator in terms of our lowering and raising operators, A and A dagger. So, our electric field operator I put the perpendicular here just to remind us that this is the, the perpendicular part of the field. Remember, the parallel part depends only on the charge distribution, uh, if you look at the, the Maxwell's equations. Okay? Um, so it's not really an independent variable. But the perpendicular part is our independent variable, which depends <coughs> on our vector potential, which we broke down into normal modes. Okay? 
Um, and then we can write it, and it comes out to this form. So this is I, epsilon. This is the polarization. OK? Um, polarization, like this. Does, doesn't matter, but just to be consistent with before. And then we have h bar omega epsilon naught v. Now this thing, this part here, uh, you can think of it as the electric field strength of a single photon in volume V. And then we have a e to the i kr minus omega t k dot r minus a dagger e to the minus i k dot r minus omega t. The B field is basically going to be the same. Uh, we're just going to have I. Um, we're just going to have instead of this part, we just have I over C. So this part is just going to be replaced by I over C K cross E cross and. Uh, the polarization. Dot, 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 the same. Then this part is that part. Now, now this is already looking a little bit, you know, if you just look at the structure of the C field, if you were to replace these a's by just some amplitude numbers, then what are you getting? Anyone? Sines and cosines. Exactly, sines and cosines, just a classical oscillating field. Okay? So if this was a classical field, you could describe it in phase space, okay, and you just get a regular oscillation uh, of a harmonic oscillator. But for the operator, we have here A and A dagger. <clears throat> okay, so let's continue. So, a convenient way of describing the harmonic oscillator is in the Fock bases, or the number bases. The Fock bases simply counts our energy levels, okay, our harmonic oscillator, our field, can be just described by a parabolic potential at the end with energy levels of equal spacing. Right, this is what you saw. This is what you saw in your first quantum mechanics course. And the energy level spacings are just h bar omega. And the operator A takes us every time and raises, takes us up the ladder. Sorry, the operator A dagger takes us up the ladder and the operator A takes us down the ladder. Okay, so let's write that explicitly. So if we have A and it's operating on a certain state N, then it takes us down to N minus 1, and it gives us a factor of square root of N. 
And if you operate with a dagger on a certain state n, so this would be 0, 1, 2, and so on and so on, we would get square root of n plus 1, n plus 1, You can now see that the number operator n can just be defined as a dagger a. Um, hang on, let's do it like this. Let's operate n on some state n, and then it will be a dagger a on some state n. And if you operate a dagger a on some state n, then you would get n And in general, you can represent the nth state as a dagger to the power of n over n square root of n factorial applied on the vacuum state, which is 0. And in this language, it is now easy to write a single photon state. What is a single photon state for this specific mode that we're talking about? So we have a certain mode. Think of a fiber that can handle one mode or a cavity that has a very narrow line shape, so it has only one mode. What is a single photon state? One. One, exactly. So a single photon. single photon is just going to be 1, okay? or a dagger on 0. And again, it can be propagating in a fiber or it can be stuck in a cavity, but as long as you defined your mode and you quantized it, this is a well-defined state. So this is our, our single photon state. These things are terrible. And now that we understand, at least conceptually, what a single photon state, I want to take the last 10 minutes and discuss what is a coherent state. Okay. Uh, unless there are, there are any are there any questions so far? Maybe I'm just moving on and on, and you're not stopping me. But... The term you wrote for B is for B per L, right? Is for? Per... Yeah. This one? What was the question? Yeah, again? Uh, perpendicular B, right? Yeah, like but the... B parallel is zero anyway. Okay. B, B parallel is zero. E parallel is not zero. It depends strictly on some charge distribution. Okay, but it's not independent. Somebody placed charges and it, you know, it's not an independent variable of the field. Okay. Uh, so you can, you, you can write this, right? You can write this. Any other questions? Okay, good. So we can talk about uh, a coherent state and understand why it's so important. So coherent state. Coherent state. Now the definition of the coherent state is that it is an eigenstate of the A operator.
Now, as you will see, this is going to be very important for quantum computation later. I'll explain that in a moment. If it's an eigen and <coughs> sorry, it's an eigenstate of the coherent state, which means that if I operate with a on alpha, I stay with alpha. So you get alpha. Alpha is a number. Okay, so coherent state is represented by some number alpha. It's a complex number. So alpha is complex. And the definition is that I have some A and I operate on this alpha state and I get the aggregate value alpha and I remain with the state alpha. And now from this simple definition, we can calculate what this alpha is in the Fock basis. And we will see that it's a superposition of several number states. And then we can talk about the properties of it and why it is so special. And we will see, and this is the importance of this, that this state is as close as you can get for quantum light to a classical light. Okay, Up until this point, when we talked about fields, we talked about a magnetic field, we talked about electric field, they were all classical fields. Okay, we had some amplitude and we had some frequency and that was oscillating and that was fine, but the description of light is actually quantum. Okay, and what I want to show you here is that the coherent state is as close as you can get and for very, very large alphas, it is practically a classical field. Okay, so when we take alpha to be very large, we're taking the limit of a classical field. And then we're going to see how that, uh, in the next chapter, we're going to see how that interacts um, with, with atoms, okay, with, with uh, two-level systems, with qubits. But for now, what I want to show, what I want to do, how long do I have? Oh, I have five minutes. So in these five minutes, all I'm going to do is derive uh, what this state looks like in the Fock basis. And then next week, we're going to be talking about the properties of the state. Okay? So, in the Fock basis, the state alpha, so we're decomposing alpha in the Fock basis, so we're going to have n, n alpha, so you project alpha on n, and then you have n, which is just going to give us some coefficient, complex coefficients, cn on n. So I just wrote something very trivial. I decomposed the state alpha into n. And now I'm just going to apply a, the operator a, on the state alpha. And if I apply it, so this is the state alpha, I'm just applying it, Cn, n. I did nothing here, and now I apply this, so I have sum over n, Cn, square root of n, n minus 1. Okay, so I just operated with a on n, so I get square root of n, n minus 1. But now our sum cannot go from 0, because there is no minus 1 state. So we have to shift everything up. So I'm going to write the exact same thing, I'm just shifting it up. Okay, so now I have sum over n, cn plus 1, square root of n plus 1, n. And we know by definition that this has to equal alpha over n. And now you have a self-consistent equation where we know that alpha times sum over n, cn, n, this thing is just what's written here. Sorry, what is written here? So alpha, this is alpha over here. Alpha, alpha, sorry, alpha, uh, alpha. mistake, sorry. 
Were you referring to that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we have this thing, and then this gives us a self-consistent equation, which means that square root of n plus 1, c n plus 1, equals alpha c n. And from this, we can calculate that c n equals alpha to the power of n over square root of n factorial c0. Uh, and c0 is just going to be given by the normalization factor. So here, cut out a window over here. So then finally, we can write alpha in the Fock bases as, so we have the sum over n alpha to the power of n over square root of n factorial over n. And here we have the normalization factor, which is e to the minus alpha over 2 squared. Okay. So the coherent state, as you can see, is a superposition of number state that has a Poisson distribution around some mean value. Okay. Well, we're going to discuss this in the beginning of next lesson. But just to give you a little spoiler, this is a Poisson distribution around some mean value. And we're going to see that this mean value is going to be the mean value of photons, so the average number of photons in this electromagnetic mode that we're talking about. Okay, but we're going to do this, all that, next week. So in the minute that we have, are there any questions? Uh, if not, we'll meet again next week. Um, and uh, good luck with submitting the homework.